to the Knowing Self, Knowing Others podcast, the fortnightly podcast that explores self-awareness, leader effectiveness and leadership at all levels. Join me, your host, Nia Thomas, as we talk to today's Knowing Self, Knowing Others guest. Today we have with us Gunther Verheyen from Belgium. And Gunther describes himself as using Scrum to humanise the workplace. So there are a couple of things we want to unpack there, both Scrum and humanising the workplace. But before we do any of that, Gunther, please do introduce yourself. Let me start, Nia, by uh, thanking you very much for inviting me on your podcast. It's a a real honour. I'm I'm glad to be here. Like I just said, I do live in Belgium, indeed. And I do a lot of work with Scrum. And at some point in time, indeed, in Scrum, we have this official role called Scrum Master. And, and at some point in time, uh, working independently, self-employed and so on, I started calling myself, indeed, a Scrum caretaker because I wanted, I wanted my job title to reflect um, that I care not just for Scrum, but also for people and the people aspect of Scrum. So it's about caring for people, it's about caring for Scrum, and combine that. And, and I, I, I hope that the word or the title Scrum Caretaker reflects that. And to um, emphasize that people aspect even more, indeed, I added to that saying, I call myself an independent Scrum Caretaker um, on a journey of humanizing the workplace with Scrum. Because I don't know how aware you are or how aware your listeners are, of the fact that Scrum is this much adopted framework for product development or for a way to tackle complex work. Now, the focus of Scrum has been since its, uh, let's say, its birth, and that's already in 1995, I imagine. The focus has been a lot on exactly that, um, delivering work, creating products, delivering products, updating, evolving, maintaining products, and so on. And that is absolutely really important. But what I miss in our beautiful world of of Scrum, which is a part of what we also call sort of the agile movement, what I miss in our world is that focus on the people aspect. Because what I see over time, certainly organizations, and certainly larger organizations, they start, let's say, getting the, almost what I call the process aspect of Scrum but they overlook the people aspect. So I want to emphasize that by saying, hey, I want to help people understand also the importance of using Scrum to humanize the workplace. Knowing that humanizing the workplace will have an enormous impact, a positive impact on products and the services that we create using Scrum. Because as you know, as well as I do, committed and engaged people perform better. They do better work. They care about their work. So a more humane workplace where people feel more at home, more comfortable, more safe, more respected, and so on, will help us create better products. That is sort of the my idea behind calling myself uh, that Scrum caretaker. And let's unpack Scrum. This is something that I'm, I'm still struggling with. And I, I had um, two guests from NHS Scotland um, on the podcast a couple of weeks ago, when listeners will remember my discussion with Donald Henderson and Satpal Singh talking about Scrum. And since then, I've been trying to work out what is a single phrase or a single sentence that I can use to describe Scrum. So this is what I've come up with so far. So tell me how far away I am with this. Scrum is about facilitating complex problem solving and action planning over small time cycles. Am I anywhere close to what Scrum is? Yeah, it certainly has an important aspect. Uh, absolutely. So what I, what I, the definition I like to use for Scrum, because people often use that, not saying it's going to be helpful, maybe not just right now, maybe in a couple of minutes, who knows? Yeah. Uh, so I, I, my, my little definition of Scrum is the following. Scrum is a simple framework to enable people to derive value from complex challenges. And you recognize already it's about dealing with complexity. Complexity meaning a complex challenge or complex problems, meaning problems that have high levels of high degrees of uncertainty, a lot of unknowns, a lot of unpredictability. And in order to tackle that, and that's where, um, let's say in your definition, uh, you've, you've replaced what I call a simple framework with something more tangible. 
In order to tackle complex, highly unpredictable problems, we try to slice the problem so that we can deal with a part of it in a short, what we call a time box, or a short cycle in time, let's say. In Scrum, by the way, we call that sprints. And by doing work in those short cycles that we call sprints, and in Scrum, we say that sprints should be more than maybe three or four weeks, uh, certainly not more than four weeks. By tackling work in short sprints, we learn from doing, from the actual tackling of the problems. So that's why we, we split up time, let's say, in short cycles, so that uh, we build in time to reflect, to stop, look back, learn, inspect, adapt. So that's where uh, what we call, let's say, the empirical uh, way of, of working in Scrum. Regularly stop, look back in that sense, inspect what you've done, inspect how you've worked, inspect your results so far, so that in your next cycle of time, which we call a sprint, so in the next sprint, you can adapt, you can change, you can adjust, you can update, you can change direction and so on. It was born in, let's say, the realm of software development, by that time, in the 90s and even later on, um, how, how did we tackle typically software development uh, with large projects in which we uh, analyzed all requirements, all the things that we thought we were going to have to build up front. We got people signing them off, agreeing of them. We did we hyper-detailed them in, in all sorts of silly, silly things uh, going really deep. And then uh, once people had approved all of that, um, upfront work we started designing solutions for that technical solutions for that once that has been done then finally maybe we started doing work that way of working which by the way we call the waterfall approach because we organize specialized work in large phases we do all of the specialized work in a large phase and the one phase follows the other one so first uh, analysis in a way to make it short then uh, designing solutions and coding solutions often testing became afterwards and releasing and so on. Now, the problem with obviously with complex and, and work that is full of uncertainties is that in that approach, we try to predict the world, let's say for the next couple of years, but there will be changes. Every change you discovered in, in a sort of later phase of such a long-term project disrupted all the things that you had been doing so far. People thought they could tackle that with what we call large methodologies. That's a word in, in, in our software development world stood for uh, describing exactly who should be doing what, what phase should be organized, what meetings, what handovers, who, who should be signing what at what point in time. So, and then we started devising projects for that often took like one, two, maybe even three years. But in the meantime, obviously, the world didn't stop changing. So there were new things popping up, emerging all the time. That ruined what we even had people sign off earlier on. Plus, in that planned approach, you can obviously only plan for what you know. And then we conveniently, as human beings, we sort of set aside all the things that we don't know. But they will pop up at some point in time. So with Scrum, we try to turn that way of working totally around. Rather than prescribing large methodologies with all things uh, designed up front and so on, we turn it around and we say, hey, let's give people minimalist toolbox on how to organize their work. So with Scrum, we describe how to organize work in short cycles that we call sprints. We, we, we describe the events that should happen in such a short cycle. And all of those events are about inspecting so that you can adapt. How you use those short building blocks up to a larger effort, we leave that totally up to people, their imagination, their context, their business, their situation, and so on. That is really, really helpful. And now I understand perfectly why you're talking about humanizing the workplace, because that, that method of working is potentially relentless unless mm -hmm. you think about the humans that are continuously reviewing situations looking yeah. at different ways of solving problems there has to be a human element if i can build quickly on that indeed the essence of scrum is also to build on the intelligence and the creativity of the people rather than creating upfront predicted plans full of detailed instructions and so on, telling all those people what to do at what point of time. That means that would that sort of rules out the usage of their brains. Yeah. Although they are smart, intelligent people, so we want to build on that.
How do you define self-awareness? That is a fairly easy and at the same time very difficult question. For me, self-awareness means it's a sort of start by understanding who you are, what you are as a person, as a human being. That means that, that includes the skills that you have, the expertise that you might have, but it also includes what you're not good at. Acknowledging, accepting, being aware, and that's often via very painful events or, uh, or happenings. Also realizing for yourself what you're not so good at, although you would love to be it maybe, or you think you're good at it, but really, so self-awareness means insights into yourself for better or for worse. And that is for me very important. It's not about just being self-confident. It's not about self-esteem for me because I'm very bad at a problem of self-confidence anyhow or self-esteem. But in a way, maybe we go meta on this. I don't know yet. But the fact that I know that I, my self-esteem is not too brilliant and that my self-confidence is rather low that is also self-awareness. So by becoming self-aware of those aspects, it has helped me rather than ignoring it or trying to replace it, whatever. In a way, you can't keep changing yourself, you know. At some point of time, I've just come to terms with it. And by coming to terms with it, I've tried and I still try to use it in my advantage. That means sometimes I'm a complete perfectionist just because I have this low self-confidence and low self-esteem, because that means I put probably more work into what I do than maybe other people should do, because I want to be absolutely sure that people like it or find it good. Uh -huh. So in that sense, it's a way of being self-aware of something that is maybe not such a really pleasant finding, and then trying to turn that around in something that is actually at least a little bit better. Do you think there's a relationship between self-awareness and leader effectiveness? Absolutely, because for me, self-awareness, so when you invited me for this, uh, for your beautiful podcast, Nia, I was reading a book about empathy, and it was a book by a biologist who's been studying and researching a lot, um, let's say, apes, primates that are really close to, to the human species. And it was about empathy. When reading that book and, and I'm thinking about this podcast, I realized, realized that for me, true empathy, which is really important, comes from self-awareness. Because it means being self-aware of yourself, meaning I'm a human being. I've got flaws, I've got problems, I've got good things, I've got a personal life, I've got a, a sense of humor. By, by that self-awareness, that creates for me a foundation for empathy because it opens me up to understanding that the people around me, the people that I work with professionally, but also my, my family that I, uh, that I love so dearly, that they're also human beings. If I avoid self-awareness, I'm probably going to, I think, radiate or impose very strange expectations on the people around me. And, and, and I remember one point of looking back now as of self-awareness is a long time ago. By the end of the 90s, I was working, it was before I discovered Scrum. So this is even before that. Okay. Uh, by the end of the 90s, I was working for a, uh, let's say, local startup in Belgium that was, uh, in, a, in a way, trying to innovate and pioneer whatever, certainly at, at the Belgium uh, level, into uh, e-commerce. The company was founded by two people that had like sky high ambitions and in that sense by that time becoming uh, the new and even the better belgium amazon think back this was 1999 not too long after that there was the econ bubble the early 2000s mm -hmm. and uh, so the sky high ambitions were like a little bit over the top at that point of time uh, that meant unfortunately i had grown into what they would call a senior management position. And the, the founders and, and, uh, of the company, which let's say sort of the CXO uh, level, the CEO and his, uh, his colleague, they had founded the company. They had to accept that things were not going as hoped for as expected. And that in their point of view meant also firing a lot of people because they had grown a lot. They had grown quickly. 
Uh, nobody anticipated the econ bubble uh, bursting. They had hired a lot of people and they were trying to get rid of a lot of them again. I was part of that exercise of selecting people that had to be fired and so on. I was so unhappy. And at some point of time, I had a, a conversation with the CEO of our company, who was only a couple of years older than I was, by the way. He had a background from McKinsey. So he'd been a, a really yeah. important McKinsey consultant before that and had a really tough discussion with it. And what I told him, I said, dear CEO, what I miss in you is emotion. We are firing people. I'm trying to understand why. I'm trying to understand that we can't really keep them. So I'm trying to go along with you, but I have difficulty with the fact that you're not showing any emotion at all. And I pushed him so far because he was trained to be cool and rational and, and whatever and, and hide emotions and so on. And it seems afterwards he admitted that I almost got him over the edge of being emotional himself. And he said, his final response was, you know what, Gunter, I keep my emotions for every evening for my wife and when I'm at home. At work, that was a point of time for me, Mia, that I realized I do not want to become like that. I want to keep my emotional side. It's okay to have an emotional side also in the workplace. Essentially inhumane of people to expect that you put all of your emotions, your senses, whatever aside, and that you act completely, let's say, uh, between quotes and rational in the workplace. That is inhumane. When he invited me to talk about self-awareness, and leadership, that was something and highlight for me that why would you try to hide your emotions as a CEO going through a phase of reorganizing, restructuring and, and, put, and even firing people? Why not show that it, it also hurts you? And that's when I decided in a way rationally that I will keep this emotional side of me alive also in the workplace. And that is for me so important. effective leaders can be found at all levels of organizations yes in, certainly in, in the world that i live in a lot so, so large organizations of uh, thriving on products and in which at least software development is really really important but still uh, so we, we we come from this old school world waterfall development waterfall approaches uh, very inhumane actually people are um, obliged to turn off their brains when they come at work which is uh, sort of silly too as a part of that we had sort of people on the workplace and then management and as this this agile movement grew and grew and grew with with scrum sort of spearheading uh, let's say the movement we try to get more in, into the world what we call self-organization so building on the creativity and the intelligence of people, not just in, in performing the work, executing the work that is expected from them, but also in how to organize that work and how to organize in teams and how to deliver. So not just what you do, but also how you do it. And, and that is an important aspect in, in my world of Agile and Scrum, self-organization. So we, we would love people to self-organize. But by doing that, say that we, we want to thrive and want to build and capitalize on the self-organizing capabilities of people, that meant that a lot of people, let's say in a management position, often feel um, in danger. Or people, a sort of sort of uh, people that say, "Yo, I'm I'm this promoter of Scrum." Um, we 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 got into a situation where we started radiating, or a lot of people started saying that management is bad. Now, that was never the idea. It's part of that sort of industrial thinking, workers on the workplace and management on top of that. So over time, people started calling that more like, it has to be leadership. We need leaders, not managers. And I think that is, that is a false dichotomy because I hope a manager to be a leader too. And if you're a true leader, you have management capabilities too. Mm -hmm. But in that sense, leadership management should be one. And it is not just limited, in my view, to the people on the, let's say, in the higher ranks or the highest positions of the letters of company. Anybody can be a leader with management capabilities because leadership means that you're really good at something, that you're able to uh, get at the cost to other people, that you can get people to, to come along with you, that you can convince them and so on. The only thing we rule out in our beautiful world is that all 
old school style command and control management or command and control leadership even. It's not about command and control. That means it's about facilitating, coaching, inspiring, helping people, uh, mentoring people, helping people, assisting them. In a way, it's about claiming authority without hierarchical authority. But leadership is about showing that you have authority that comes from knowledge, from insights, from how you deal with people. And that, that can happen on all levels in an organization. at the most strategic level of organizations have greater self-awareness than leaders at other levels of organizations? I'm going to be very blunt and I think I'm scared that the opposite is true. What, I, what I've noticed in my sort of career with uh, Scrum, but even before that, like working for that, uh, that startup company and other companies, what I've noticed, but those things you only start realizing as you grow older yourself, and, you, and you, you regularly reflect and look back on those experiences. What I've noticed seems to be natural and expected of people as they climb the ladder within an organization. It seems to have this, this implicit expectation that people leave their emotions behind more and more and more, or okay. even their human side. You know, you have to be rational. You have to be... You have to be sure, you have to be certain, you have to come across as the leader, the manager, whatever. And I'm like, what is so bad about showing uncertainties and showing emotions? There's nothing bad about it. On the contrary, even, it would be somebody that I would look up to, somebody who's not scared to show emotions and scared to show uncertainty and scared to show that, you know what, I have no idea where we're going to. I think it should be this direction, but I'm also not really sure, so help me out, guys. So, But in traditional organizations, certainly the ones that thrive on what I call that old school way of working, what I call the industrial paradigm, as you climb the ladder, it seems that you have to come across as the one that who always knows, who is sure, and so on. And I think the opposite is true. So as people climb the ladder, I'm afraid a lot of them leave their uh, human side behind them. It's like as if we expect people to, in the morning, come into the office and leave all of that stuff behind them. That is not normal. That is not natural. That is not even possible. We break people by doing that. That's how people end up in long-term absences, burnouts, and so on. So I'm afraid... Is the opposite is true. The hopeful message is that with Scrum, for me, we try to help people also in a management position to sort of reinvent themselves based upon the fact that we're now going to do Scrum, work in short cycles, and thrive on self-organizing teams. That is, for me, a way, tools for managers, people in a leadership position to also reinvent themselves and offload a lot of pressures to get the pressure off their shoulders only. You don't have to be continuously 24 seven, the superhero that knows it all. It's one of the aspects that I believe we try to work on. And I've, I've run a couple of times in a situation of working with uh, CXO people, CXO teams or CXO individuals, where I've had sometimes the feedback from the people around that person like secretaries that has been with him or her for a really long time that says, oh, God, it's so nice that we're now working with Scrum. I've seen my manager, my CXO, often even the CEO, I've seen him relax and even find his or his human centrism again. Because yeah. a lot of those people are like really great people managers, but as they start climbing the ladder, that's an aspect that they seem to forget leave behind by their own will or by uh, external expectations so sometimes I've, I've heard that feedback and that sort of that really warms warms my heart do you think that the organizations where the the more traditional industrial paradigm do you think those organizations are changing because we've talked about organizations that are new and the startups that maybe have a different mm -hmm. world view but do you think the old style organizations themselves are also changing well i don't know if they all are changing but why that do what i do know uh, mia that if they don't start changing they will become obsolete in some way 
it might take a little bit longer, but in that sense, talking about complexity, I think the world has always been a complex place throughout history. Human societies have always been highly complex. What is so um, important and is so increasing complexity for me of today's world is this online things, it's 24-7, this real-time thing. So, so we are connected all the time. We have to like be online all the time. It's a globalized planet, uh, at least in the, in, in the virtual world. That is That creates an enormous overload of information, expectations, requirements, and so on also a lot of competition that means the complexity has is becoming so huge um, even even if uh, also the past worlds even the industrial worlds were already complex but is, it is becoming so complex these days that um, agility flexibility the ability to respond the ability to innovate to the ability to capitalize on unforeseen opportunities is going to be so huge the demands for that sort of agility is going to become so huge that any organization that is not willing to change its way of working towards that sort of agility is doomed and what we've already seen over time the, let's say the past 40 50 years at least is that the companies that are sort of in the top 100 companies around the world there's a sort of turnover in 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 companies that are part of that that is increasing that means, uh, let's say, 30, 40 years ago, the companies in the, let's say, the top 50, the top 100 companies in throughout the world, that was pretty stable. That, that, that list is more and more unstable in that sense that companies disappear from the list, other companies enter the list, and uh, the amount of time that companies still spend on that list, let's say, is becoming shorter and shorter and shorter. Right. So there's some sort of turnover. What I see with larger companies is often the tendency that they are sitting often on a, on a large amount of cash. Oh, we've got plenty of cash. We've got plenty of revenues. Yeah, but you know what? It's from old products. It's from things that you can't maintain, that you can't evolve, that won't keep you going until for the next 10 years. But often people like to hide themselves. It's Maybe that's a, that's a, that's a way of uh, self-awareness or lack of self-awareness too. They hide themselves from the fact that that won't last them. It looks good now, but you know, things go so fast. Is it changing companies in a way? Yes, absolutely. What we've seen certainly since, you know, Scrum 1995 and this agile movement taking off is what we call the agile manifesto was in 2001. We've seen this way of thinking overtaking the world. But again, like I said, and, and in a way like we started, it's still too much process oriented. Because a lot of those people technically understand the importance of a process like Scrum, but they fail to really empower or even set free self-organization within their organizations. They still don't really trust their people. So we're missing an important aspect. But the change is happening. The process aspect first, I hope to be contributing to shift people's focus or mind towards more that people aspect. That's why I call it humanizing the workplace with Scrum, because we have a lot of non-engaged and even disengaged people on the work floor. And the figures, the statistics are dramatic. That means up to 70, 80% typically of the workforce say that they are not engaged or even disengaged, almost working against their companies. Imagine the potential of re-engaging those people. There is not a single aspect in, in running a business, running a corporation that has more potential of improvement than the engagement or the lack of engagement of people on the work floor. And Scrum, with this focus on self-organization and self-organizing teams, is the tool in a way to set people free without giving up on the idea that they work within certain expectations, certain goals, within a certain vision. It's not like anarchy where we don't expect people to uh, live by certain expectations. So Scrum has this enormous potential to help organizations change even more. Do you think effective leaders have more self-awareness than ineffective leaders? Yes, uh, because... Uh, can I can I turn it around? You can. Because 
self-awareness leads to higher effectiveness. So that means an effective leader compared to whatever we would call an ineffective leader, I would assume that at least one aspect that might be contributing to one person being more effective as a leader than another person is probably self-awareness. Next to lots of other things probably, but it's certainly something that will contribute to high effectiveness. I, I, I'm not a fan of the word effectiveness, by the way, so that's why I struggle a little bit. But well, is, is it leader effectiveness or effectiveness because of, of the potential that it, it can be described and defined in so many different ways? Yes, if you have to be effective or effective, a uh, high level of effectiveness, that sounds a lot like terms that we use in our environment a lot. You know, this thing called utilization. Uh, uh, in that sense, you're highly effective if, if your utilization is really high. That often means that you um, look very busy. It doesn't mean that you're actually doing okay. something, but yeah. you look very busy. Where um, I always think of my own work as, as this little independent uh, scrum person that I am. My utilization is maybe real low, unless I would also count in taking a walk outside and coming up with amazing ideas while I was trying to enjoy nature or when I'm working in the garden. So effectiveness is something in a way dangerous because when I'm out in the garden, I come up with beautiful ideas. And, oh, I have to take a note or at least make a mental note for something that I want to do tomorrow. Oh, I was writing about this article. Oh, I could, I could take it in this direction. You know, so the writing of the article, in, in my example, is is the sort of effectiveness. But there's a lot of things that will help me be more effective in writing. Yeah, so absolutely. I agree. Effectiveness is, is a very, very broad term. And I think every role has a different definition of effectiveness. Every organization has a different definition of effectiveness. So, yes, I would definitely agree that it's very broad and very difficult to pin down. Gunther Verheiren, thank you so much for joining me today. I've learned more about Scrum and I've learned more about humanising the workplace through Scrum. Hopefully listeners have also learned more about Scrum um, and maybe it's something that they want to think about in their workplace as well. So in the show notes, I will make sure that there is a link to your website in case they want to find out some more about it or maybe even join you on a training session. Beautiful, thank you. Wonderful. Gunther Verheiren, thank you very much. Thank you, Nia, for having me on the show, and I hope your listeners will enjoy it. Thank you for joining me, your host, Nia Thomas, at the Knowing Self, Knowing Others podcast. If you'd like to know more about self-awareness, leader effectiveness, and leadership at all levels, please take a look at my website, knowingselfknowingothers.co.uk. You can also join me on YouTube, LinkedIn, or Twitter. Make sure you bookmark the Knowing Self, Knowing Others podcast and tune into the next episode in two weeks' time. I look forward to having you on my learning journey. If you'd like to join me as a guest on the Knowing Self, Knowing Others podcast, please drop me a line at info at knowingselfknowingothers.co.uk. If you'd like to advertise your podcast, book or company connected to self-awareness, leader effectiveness or leadership at all levels, please drop me a line at the same email. Please remember to bookmark the Knowing Self, Knowing Others podcast so that you can keep up to date with all new episodes. Remember to rate this podcast on whichever directory you listen. Knowing Self, Knowing Others is available to listen on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, Podcast Index, Podcast Addict, Podcast.